So today we're doing a read through of Judge Mazzullo's order that denied Scott Peterson a new trial. It's a 55 page document. So if you're like most of us, um, it's much easier to be able to plug in some headphones and listen. So I will be reading through just a quick um, disclaimer. Um, the footnotes are going to be inserted at the end of whatever sentence that they're they appear in. So if you go to San Mateo Court's website and pull this document for yourself, you're going to notice that the read through is going to incorporate those footnotes. Um, so let's get started because it's a lengthy, lengthy, lengthy document. Filed San Mateo County, December 20th, 2022. Clerk of Superior Courts by Emily Gopez, Deputy Clerk. Superior Court of the State of California, County of San Mateo. In regards to Scott Lee Peterson on habeas corpus, case number SC055500A related to California Supreme Court number S230782, order on writ of habeas corpus. Introduction. Scott Lee Peterson, petitioner, was convicted of murdering his wife and unborn child after a jury trial. He claims in a petition for writ of habeas corpus that he was deprived of his constitutional right to a fair and impartial jury because of a trial juror's alleged concealment of bias during voir dire. Footnote one, the juror was identified by name during the evidentiary hearing with her consent, but this court will continue to use the identifier used by the California Supreme Court and will refer to the juror as juror number seven. Petition for writ of habeas corpus, petition, page 96, footnote two, in an order dated February 15th, 2022, this court took judicial notice of the habeas pleadings filed in this case with the California Supreme Court, including the petition for writ of habeas corpus, claim one, and the informal pleadings filed by the parties. Order regarding respondents request that the court take judicial notice of respondents pleadings filed February 15th, 2022. The petition includes nine exhibits as part of claim one, exhibits eight, 44 through 47, 49 through 52. To be comprehensive, the court also takes judicial notice of the transcripts and court records in People v. Peterson, San Mateo County Superior Court, SC 55500A, in the direct appeal, People v. Peterson, SC 132449 in the habeas proceedings in regarding Scott P. Scott Lee Peterson on habeas corpus S230782. Petitioner claims that his conviction should be vacated because the juror committed pre pre blah, 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 prejudicial misconduct by providing false answers in her jury questionnaire during the jury selection process. Petitioner's petition was originally filed in the California Supreme Court in, in conjunction with his direct appeal. In October 2020, the Supreme Court issued an order to show cause, remanding the case to the San Mateo Superior Court and requiring respondent to show cause why the relief prayed for should not be granted on the grounds that juror number seven committed prejudicial misconduct by not disclosing her prior involvement with other legal proceedings, including but not limited to being the victim of crime as alleged in claim one. In regarding Scott Peterson on habeas corpus S230782, order filed on October 14th, 2020. On remand, this court reviewed the full record, conducted a five-day evidentiary hearing, and considered the extensive briefing submitted by the parties. For the reasons set forth in detail below, this petition is denied. So procedural history. I might skip over citations, you guys, um, just because they get tedious. In April 20. Uh, 2003, petitioner was charged with the December 2002 murders of his wife, Lacey Peterson, and their unborn child, Connor, in violation of Penal Code Section 187. The information added a multiple murder special circumstance in violation of Penal Code Section 190.2, Subdivision A3. Petitioner pled not guilty and was tried by a jury. A five-month jury trial began on June 1, 2004. The jury began deliberations on November 3rd of 2004.
The jury continued deliberating until noon on November 9th, when the first of two jurors was dismissed. Petitioner was represented by Clifford Gardner, Esquire, Habeas Corpus Resource Center, by and through Shelley Sedinsky and Andrea Farkas, and Pat Harris of the Law Office of Pat Harris. Respondent was, re was represented by Stanislaus Clowney, uh, District Attorney Bridget Flanager, and Special Assistant District Attorney Dave Harris. Footnote four, the reason for dismissal of these two jurors is not relevant to this petition. This juror was replaced by alternative juror number two, the juror who ultimately became juror number seven and whose questionnaire and voir dire are the subject of petitioner's habeas claims. Juror number seven ultimately deliberated in both the guilt and pen penalty phase of this trial. After another juror was dismissed and replaced, deliberations resumed and continued until November 12th of 2004 when the jury found petitioner guilty of first degree murder and guilty of the lesser included offenses of second degree murder. The jury found the multiple murder special circumstance to be true. During the penalty phase, the jury returned a death verdict and petitioner was sentenced to death. Petitioner appealed the jury verdict and death sentence to the California Supreme Court. While his direct appeal was pending, petitioner filed the instant petition on October 24th, 2020, the California Supreme Court unanimously affirmed petitioner's conviction, but reversed his death sentence. People versus Peterson, 2020, and there's the citation. On October 14th, 2020, the Supreme Court issued its order to show cause on the petition for the habeas corpus. The case was remanded to the Superior Court for further proceedings related to both the death penalty and the petition. On May 28, 2021, the district attorney informed the court that it would no longer seek the death penalty. And on December 8th of 2021, the court resentenced petitioner to life in prison without the possibility of parole, leaving the petition pending for further proceedings. On the petition, respondent filed a return and petitioner filed a denial. Because respondent's return contained new documentation regarding juror number seven, mm -hmm, of which petitioner was previously unaware, the denial included additional factual allegations regarding the juror misconduct claim, footnote five. In its return, respondent provided documentation showing that in November of 2001, juror number seven's ex-boyfriend, Eddie Whiteside, was charged with domestic violence against juror number seven and pled no contest to battery. Because juror number seven had not disclosed the incident in response to question 74 in the jury questionnaire asking if she had ever been the victim of a crime, petitioner made additional factual allegations in his denial to the return. A supplemental return and supplemental denial then followed. After reviewing the returns and denials, the court scheduled an evidentiary hearing for February 25th 28th and March 1st of 2022. Testimony resumed on March 24th and concluded on March 25th. The parties filed post evidentiary briefs. An oral argument was held on August 11th of 2022. The matter was taken under submission on September 16th of 2022 following the submission of proposed memorandums of decision by both sides. Footnote six, the evidentiary hearing was briefly reopened by order dated December 8th, 2022 to correct an error in an exhibit that had been admitted at the request of the petitioner. Exhibit one, now sealed, contained a full social security number of Ms. Marcella Kinsley. Ms. Kinsley's role in the habeas proceedings is explained later in this order. Rule 1.201 of the California Rules of Court mandates in pertinent part that attorneys who file papers in the court's public file, redact all but the last four digits of the social security number, and only file that portion of the social security number when required. The rule very clearly states that the purpose of this requirement is to protect personal privacy and other, le and other legitimate interests. Exhibit one was replaced by stipulation of the parties dated December 15th with exhibit 1A. The correction delayed the court in issuing this order by its originally intended December 16th, 2022 issue day. And reminder, this was then issued on the 
20th, so it delayed it by four days. Let me go back. Mm -mm. Factual background and challenge statements. Petitioner's claims concern statements made by juror number seven, both to her answers and questions in the jury questionnaire and during in-person voir dire. Subsection A, juror number seven's answers to the jury questionnaire. The jury selection process began on March 4th, 2004. Prospective jurors were asked to complete a 116 question, 20 page written questionnaire under penalty of perjury. Note seven, unless otherwise indicated, all references to exhibits are to habeas evidentiary hearing exhibits. Neat. On March 9th, 2004, under penalty of perjury, juror number seven filled out her jury questionnaire. She did not seek a hardship discharge. Relevant here are questions 54A, 54B, and 74. But note eight in petition. Petitioner also claims juror number seven gave a false answer to question 72 on the questionnaire, which asks if she ever participated in a trial as a party witness or interested observer. Petitioner failed to address question 72 at the evidentiary hearing or in his post hearing brief. The court addresses this claim, however, below. Juror number seven's answers were as follows. 54A, have you ever been involved in a lawsuit? A lawsuit other than a divorce proceedings? Juror number seven checked no. 54B, if yes, were you, and then there's some check boxes, the plaintiff, the defendant, both. Juror number seven left 54B blank. Question 74, have you or any of your, any member of your family or close friends ever been the victim or witness to any crime? Juror number seven checked no. In addition to these questions, juror number seven gave answers to the questions that provided the trial attorneys additional information about her and her views of the case. For instance, juror number seven was, ena was enabled to state where her parents were born, putting a question mark in the space for her answers. She listed high school as her educational background with, and then there are spelling corrections in here, guys, indicated with some asterisks, with some college or technical school as a medical assistant, comma, CNA. Despite answers that she received training as a medical assistant, she also responded no to the very next question, which asked, have you ever studied or received training in medicine, psychology, psychiatry, social work, sociology, or counseling? Her questionnaire answers also contained several misspellings, which if you're reading the document, you see. Juror number seven provided her view on the death penalty as well. Question 107 asked, what are your feelings regarding the death penalty? Juror number seven responded, if without a doubt someone did something that bad, all the evidence was there, then if that is the sentence given, then the person needs to have that sentence. Similarly, when asked, what are your feelings regarding life in prison without the possibility of parole? In question 108, she responded, same as above, if without a doubt all evidence is there. Footnote 10, the standard applied in criminal proceedings is proof beyond a reasonable doubt based on her answers to the question juror seven was at the time using a different standard of without a doubt, yet neither side followed up with her regarding this response during in-person voir dire. It also gives a footnote that I think I missed um, about her CNA. Juror number seven wrote out home health care in response, in response to question 32 police academy class for question 44, no feelings for question 40, cats and dogs on question 63, just the, uh, we got some misspellings. Oh, this is fun. Okay, hold on. Um, let me reread that. <laughs> Footnote nine, here's her misspellings. Juror number seven wrote out home Heathcare in response to question 32. Police 
Academy, A-C-A-D-A-M-E-Y class. No feelings, feeling apostrophe S. Cat and dogs, dog is a dog apostrophe S. Just the basics, basics is basic with an apostrophe S. And they help serve with no E, S-E-R-V, the people. That was a fun one. I had to go back and reread that. <clears throat> In person, Wadir of juror number seven. After filling out her questionnaire, juror number seven returned in person on April 12th, 2004 to be questioned by the trial court and counsel during the phase of the trial known as Wadir. Footnote 11, Wadir is the examination by oral and direct questioning of the prospective jurors following the completion of the trial judge's initial examination. Leads us right into footnote 12, juror number seven's juror number for the jury selection phase of the trial was 6756. Initially, the trial court asked juror number seven how long her employer would pay her for jury service, given that the expected length of the trial was set for five months. When juror number seven responded, responded that her employer would only pay for two weeks, the trial judge excused her. Juror number seven did not protest or indicate on the record any hesitation with being excused. Juror number seven testified at the evidentiary hearing that after she was excused, she grabbed her things and was starting to leave when petitioner's counsel, Mark Garagos, requested that she remain. Juror number seven recalled that she had stepped across, quote unquote, about three chair lengths before Mr. Garagos asked that she not be dismissed. Question. And when you said the judge dismissed you, the judge basically did what? Answer, I don't remember exactly how it went, but he said, your job is not paying and you're dismissed. And I grabbed my things and I stood up from the chair and I thanked him and I started to walk out and Mr. Garrigo said, I object or something along those lines or whatever his legal term was. And then I sat back down. Juror number seven recalled that during what year, she informed the trial judge that she did not fill out hardship because she, quote unquote, lived with her mother and her kid's father. So financially, she would be OK. The transcript of the April 12th, 2004 voir dire is consistent with juror number seven's memory of her interaction with that trial judge. After Mr. Garagos interceded, juror number seven, like some of the other prospective jurors, indicated her willingness to serve despite only limited jury service pay by their employer. During voir dire, Mr. Garagos expressed to juror number seven that what he was really concerned about were the answers to, public, to publicity questions that she listed on her questionnaire. Mr. Garagos asked juror number seven about publicity and out-of-court discussions she had about petitioner's guilt or innocence, including discussions about cheating. Question, yeah, now when the people would express their opinions to you, kind of what I'm getting at is did you, I mean, did you express any kind of opinion back? Did you say, yeah, that looks bad, or he was cheating on his wife or anything along those lines? Answer, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it does look bad. If anything, I said it's not looking good. Question, okay. Now, when you come in here, do you think that you, I know that we ask those questions and who knows, I mean, you know, you've never been through this. <clears throat> Answer, right. Question, I've never been through this. The judge has never been through a case like this. But do you think that you can set that kind of, the fact that you have an expressed opinion aside? And Rochelle Nice's answer was, I think I can. There was no follow-up regarding juror number seven's opinion about petitioner's cheating after this limited colloquy. In addition, at no time during the voir dire did either side ask juror number seven about issues pertaining to domestic violence, define the term lawsuit, 
or make any additional inquiries to refine the questions in the questionnaire, despite the district attorneys acknowledging in open court that other jurors had informed the court that at least some of them and some of the questions were not entirely clear. Oop, I'm having kitty issues, you guys. Don't do it. hazards of a live recording. Petitioner's claims. According to petitioner, juror number seven committed misconduct by intentionally providing false answers in her jury questionnaire. Petitioner's theory is that because of the unmatched pretrial publicity in the case, prospective jurors were aware of the people's theory that petitioner assaulted his pregnant wife, killing her and their unborn child while cheating on her. Hold on, you guys. Ray, get down. You hear all the jingling in the background. That is my cat. He's trying to send a fax. And if you're not new to the channel, you know he's he's good for that. We don't know who he's faxing, but he wants to fax something. Um, while cheating on her during jury selection, petitioner contends juror number seven concealed that when she was five months pregnant, she too had been threatened, and she sought and received a restraining order after hearing after a hearing stating in her restraining order petition that she feared for herself and the life of her unborn child. The restrained party was Marcella Kinsley, the ex-girlfriend of juror number seven's ex-boyfriend, Eddie Whiteside. She also failed to reveal an alleged domestic violence incident that occurred in 2001 involving Mr. Whiteside. Petitioner contends that juror number seven concealed this material and relevant information because she was actually biased against Petitioner and wanted to be on the jury to punish him for what she believed had been done to his unborn child. Following the filing of the respondent's return and supplemental return, the petitioner's denial and supplemental denial, the following core material factual allegations are in dispute. dispute. So we got factual allegation number 22. Petitioner alleges that juror number seven wanted to sit in judgment of Mr. Peterson in part to punish him for a crime of harming his unborn son, a crime that she personally experienced when Marcella Kinsley threatened juror number seven's life and the life of her unborn child. Factual allegation number 23, for this reason, juror number seven was actually biased against the petitioner. Factual allegation number 24, Juror number seven's bias, based on her own victimization as a woman whose unborn child was threatened by another, was confirmed during deliberations. Ten jurors voted to convict Mr. Peterson of second-degree murder of the unborn child. Juror number seven was a holdout juror wow. who strenuously argued that the killing of the unborn child was first-degree murder. During deliberations, juror number seven passionately and personally argue to her fellow jurors, how can you not kill the baby? Juror number seven said, pointing to her own stomach. As the jurors recounted the deliberations, the issue of fetus versus a living child also came into play for some jurors, but not for juror number seven. This was no fetus, this was a child, juror number seven said. Everyone heard I referred to him as little man. If he could have been born, he would have survived. It's unfair. He didn't give that baby a chance. Factual allegation number 26. In letters to petitioner, juror number seven disclosed an obsessive interest in the death of Peterson's unborn child. Yikes. Yeah. Factual allegation number 33. Juror number seven concealed on voir dire a subject that was extremely important and emotionally critical to her that she had personally experienced the threat of losing a child through the intentional harassing conduct of her ex-boyfriend's girlfriend. Factual allegation number 34. Juror number seven's experience of a juror deeply concerned about losing an unborn child through intentional misconduct of another was material to the issue in petitioner's case, which similarly involved the death of an unborn child through misconduct of another. Testimony and evidence at the hearing. The court determined that an evidentiary hearing was required to resolve the party's disputes over these allegations. The following summarizes the evidence related to the petitioner's claims. 
number one, juror number seven's December 10th, 2020 declaration. The first witness called by petitioner was juror number seven. She was questioned for almost two days. Initially, she appeared nervous. Her attorney, Jeffrey Carr, was present in the courtroom. After several, several, blah, 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 several preliminary questions, we have a dog barking outside, causing my dog to bark. Okay. All right, they're done. They just wanted to weigh in. After several, several preliminary questions, Mr. Carr invoked juror number seven's right to remain silent, so we pled the fifth. And the respondent, district attorney, presented the court with a grant of immunity, which was signed and entered into the record. Petitioner started his examination of juror number seven by directing her attention to the de declaration that she signed on December 10th, 2020, included in the respondent's return. Juror number seven confirmed she understood what perjury meant. Juror number seven was directed to specific statements made in the, de in the deliberation asking if they were truthful and accurate. As to some statements, she responded that they were absolutely truthful and accurate. And to others, she responded yes or yeah. And some she would testify as more or less and or gave an explanation. Relevant to the court's inquiry here are some of the following questions and answers. Question. We were on question five, statement five. If you look at paragraph five, was paragraph five a truthful and accurate statement? This goes to par uh, footnote 13, paragraph five stated, I responded to the juror questionnaire candidly, truthfully, and to the best of my ability. Nisa's answer was absolutely. Question, okay, was paragraph eight a truthful and accurate statement? Footnote 14. I have never been a plaintiff or defendant to my memory and therefore placed an X in the response field to question 54A. She answered, absolutely. Question, I will take you to paragraph 10. Take a second and read it. Was paragraph 10 a truthful and accurate statement? Paragraph 10 stated at the time that I answered these questions together and right in the middle of a 20 page questionnaire, I understood the word lawsuit to mean and refer to a suit for money or property. I did not think the question was a reference to any other appearance in court. She responded, yes. Question and taking you to paragraph 11, was paragraph 11 a truthful and accurate statement? Paragraph 11 said, I am not a lawyer and have no legal education. So my understanding of the word lawsuit at the time that I filled out the, the form excluded all other types of court proceedings. I also looked to the language of question 54B, which referred to plaintiff and defendant to confirm my understanding of the question. She answered, yeah, so that was a yeah. Question, I'll take you to paragraph 12, please. Was paragraph 12 a truthful and accurate statement? Footnote, paragraph 12 stated, I was not asked to clarify this written response by the judge or either of the parties or their representatives. No one followed up with me to explain what the word lawsuit meant to me. No one defined the word lawsuit to me to include being in court for any reason. She answered, yes, that was a truthful statement. Question, thank you. I'll skip down to paragraph 16. Is paragraph 16 a truthful and accurate statement? But no, paragraph, paragraph 16 stated, I answered all the questions that were asked of me by the judge the prosecutors and the defense attorneys. I clarified my oral responses when I was asked to do so, an opportunity I was not given when I filled out my written questionnaire. She said, yes, it's a truthful statement. Question, I'll skip you to paragraph 18, please. With paragraph 18, truthful and accurate. Footnote states, paragraph 18 stated, at no time during the jury selection process did any court case in which I was involved cross my mind. The answer was yes. 
juror number seven confirmed as truthful and accurate her statement at the time of the jury selection. She did not recall that she had requested a restraining order against Marcella Kinsley. In November of 2000, four years earlier, okay, three years earlier, pardon me. She clarified, however, that her statement that Miss Kinsley had come to her home to confront her about juror number seven's relationship with Miss Kinsley's ex-boyfriend, Eddie Whiteside, was more or less truthful and accurate because Miss Kinsley had not come to confront her, but rather Mr. Whiteside. Juror number seven answered yes in response to paragraph 21's accuracy, which stated in part that she sought a restraining order based on that behavior described in paragraph 20. Footnote 20. Juror number seven statement and testimony that she sought a restraining order based on Miss Kinsley's behavior on September 23rd of 2000 is inconsistent with her later testimony that the restraining order wasn't a result of when she came to my home, but rather because Miss Kinsley had continued to bother her in the following months. Inconsistence. <sighs> Juror number seven also confirmed the statements in the same paragraph that she did not hire an attorney, but rather filed the petition herself. With respect to paragraph 22, juror number seven explained that the whole paragraph was somewhat true. Footnote 21 says paragraph 22 stated, I did not and still do not personally know what resulted of Marcella Kinsley's behavior the night that she disturbed my peace. I did not testify against her in any criminal action and cannot state with any level of certainty whether her actions resulted in any conviction or otherwise. Based on the fact that I did not participate in any criminal proceedings, I did not consider myself a victim of a crime. I still do not. I never sought to prosecute Marcella Kinsley for her behavior for that very reason. She clarified that she did not consider herself a victim of Miss Kinsley's behavior testifying. That's been a long time, but if I recall, there may have been a court date and I do remember telling the judge I'll drop all charges against Marcella. Juror number seven confirmed the paragraph 23 and 24 were truthful and accurate statements. Heading on down to footnote 22, paragraph 23 stated, I did not interpret the circumstances leading to the petition for a restraining order as a crime. And I still do not. Paragraph 24 stated, minor indignities, shoving matches, Raising of voices and other undignified means of communicating frustration do not stick out to me, let alone cause me to feel victimized the way the law might define that term. Mm. Mm -hmm. Regarding paragraph 25, she testified that the paragraph was somewhat truthful and accurate, explaining it's just different wording than I would, how I would word it. I've been in many fights and I don't consider myself a victim. Might be different from you or somebody else. You might consider a fight, I mean, you might consider that you're a victim, but I don't. Footnote 23 says paragraph 25, it stated, I had been involved in many loud verbal disagreements. I've never considered myself a victim and I do not know whether lawyers and judges would agree or disagree with my opinion. Paragraphs 26 to 30 of her December 10th, 2020 declaration dealt with November of 2001 involving herself and Mr. Eddie Whiteside. When questioned about paragraph 30, juror number seven testified that the first sentence, no one has ever contacted me about this incident and it never crossed my mind during jury selection of the trial of Scott Peterson was true. And that the next two sentences, this incident did not stick out to me as anything out of the ordinary, nor did it ever cross my mind when I was responding to the jury questionnaire. Had it crossed my mind or had I been asked about it specifically, I would have immediately disclosed the incident. She responded as being absolutely true. 
juror number seven was asked about paragraph 31, which stated at no time before, during, or after the Scott Peterson trial, did I ever for a moment harbor any personal animus towards Scott Peterson? Hmm. Before, during, or after. Okay, I read that right. Nor was I biased against him or in favor of the prosecution. She testified as follows. Question. Okay, paragraph 31. Would you take a minute to look at that? Answer. This is partially true. Yes. Okay. Question. Okay, when you say partially true, what do you mean by that? Answer. Before the trial, I didn't have any anger or any resentments towards Scott Peterson at all. After the trial, it was a bit different because I sat through the entire trial and listened to all the evidence. Question. Okay. So that is partially true. Is this the before the trial, but not necessarily after the trial? Am I getting that right? Answer. Right. As to the three remaining paragraphs, petitioner only asked juror number seven about paragraphs 32 and 33, but not 34. Footnote 24, paragraph 32 stated, I did not purposely withhold any information from the court during the jury selection process. I have had countless unpleasant experiences in my life. Those outlined above did not cross my mind during any portion of the jury selection process or during the trial. They did not play any role in my evaluation of the evidence or my verdicts. Paragraph 33 stated, I did not form any conclusions regarding the evidence in the case until I was called into the jury deliberation room. I recall discussing the evidence with the remaining jurors before a unanimous verdict was reached. Paragraph 34 says, I will, or I have an abiding conviction that the charges are true based on the evidence that was presented at trial. This abiding conviction is based solely on the strength of the evidence presented within the trial. <coughs> Excuse me, you guys. Um, let's see. Petitioner then, quite, wait, let me see here. I just lost my spot, you guys. Okay. It goes on to question her about each sentence. All right. So they're going to break it down by sentences now. Question. Okay. Thank you. Now, if you go to paragraph 32, first, first sentence, uh, answer was first sentence is absolutely true. Question. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I should have gone sentence by sentence. So the first sentence is true and accurate. Answer. It is. Second sentence, please. Answer, yeah, I've had unpleasant situations in my life. Question, okay, so that's true and accurate. Answer, sure. Question, the third sentence. Answer, absolutely true. Question, okay, and the last sentence. Answer, absolutely true. Question, now let's go to the last one in paragraph 33. If you would read that first sentence there, please, and let us know if that sentence is true and accurate. Answer, that's absolutely true. Question, okay, and that last sentence? Answer, that's true. Mm -mm. Juror number seven, okay, so we're section two now. Juror number seven's testimony about the Marcella Kinsley incident. Juror number seven testified, testified about the December, November, pardon me, ooh, November 27th, 2000 application for a restraining order involving Marcella Kinsley, the former girlfriend of juror number seven's then boyfriend, Eddie Whiteside. Footnote 25. There is a slight ambiguity in the record. In her November 2000 petition for a restraining order, juror number seven refers to Mr. Whiteside as her ex-boyfriend at the time of the September 23rd, 2000 incident. During her testimony, however, juror number seven referred to Mr. Whiteside as her boyfriend at the time. Juror number seven's memory surrounding her November 27th, 2000 application against Mr. against Mrs. Kinsley and the December 13th, 2000 restraining order hearing in the San Mateo Superior Court was imperfect. 
given the passage of over two decades. Juror number seven was able to recall some things, but not others. For example, juror number seven was able to recall bringing the restraining order forms to the court, but not going and testifying about the incidents at any hearing. Juror number seven's testimony about the reason for seeking a restraining order against Ms. Kinsley was inconsistent at points. Juror number seven was shown the court filings for the application for a restraining order. Let me zoom on down to footnote 26. Exhibit 1A was admitted for limited purposes during the 2022 evidentiary hearing in Exhibit 45. Attached to the uh, petition contained the same documents relating to juror number seven's restraining order litigation against Ms. Kinsley. She acknowledged that the handwriting was hers, but did not remember filling out the paperwork. I know I did, she stated, despite confirming the language in paragraph 20 and 21 of her December 10th, 2020 declaration that she sought a restraining order based on the behavior of Miss Kinsley coming to her home where she lived and causing a disturbance on September 23rd, 2000. Juror number seven testified at the hearing that had Miss Kinsley not continued with other conduct after that incident, she would not have filed for a restraining order. According, according to juror number seven, the September incident showed a history of being a little stalkerish, which is why juror number seven included it in her restraining order application. The other alleged conduct juror number seven listed in the application included Mrs. Kinsley, one, telling Mr. Whiteside that she saw his car in juror number seven's driveway, two, calling juror number seven's new home phone on November 11th, 2000, and hanging up when juror number seven answered, thereafter calling juror number seven's phone again and saying it was, quote unquote, Kim, <laughs> that's what it says, when juror number seven answered the second time those Kims. Anyway, um, number three, allegedly checking the caller ID at Mr. Whiteside's mother's home. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Number three, allegedly checking the caller ID at Mr. Whiteside's mother's home in order to get juror number seven's new phone number. Mm. Yikes. And number four, following uh, juror number seven on November 21st, 2000, in her car and pointing her finger at juror number seven. Footnote 27, on December 13th, 2000, San Mateo Superior Court Commissioner Rosemary Pfeiffer granted juror number seven's request for a restraining order and ordered Miss Kinsley to stay at least 100 yards away from juror number seven and her unborn child. So she was successful is what that's saying. Juror number seven also testified that she did not think that a petition for civil harassment restraining order was a lawsuit and, didn't, and did not even recall the Kinsley incident. Footnote 28 says the September 23rd, 2000 incident where Miss Kinsley came to juror number seven's home is at times in this order going to be referred to now as the Kinsley incident. Fair enough. She testified several times that it never crossed her mind ever. Juror number seven further testified that I don't hold on to things. I just didn't remember. That was over and I didn't hold any grudges. It was past me. Juror number seven admitted that she filed a second lawsuit. Second lawsuit. Wait, wait. I don't hold on to things. I just didn't remember. That was over. I didn't hold any grudges. It was past me. Next sentence, juror number seven admitted that she filed a second lawsuit against Miss Kinsley seeking damages, <gasps> money damages, as a result of Mrs. Kinsley's conduct. The second lawsuit was filed in Santa Clara County and sought lost wages and a number of other things. No record of the suit was admitted into evidence in this case. Juror number seven stated on the stand that she understood a lawsuit to mean when you sue someone for money. Though she later clarified that in her mind, she didn't sue Miss Kinsley because she ultimately dropped the charges the first time she went before a judge about this civil lawsuit. 
<sighs> when asked why she dropped that suit, juror number seven replied, because it was over with and her and I came to the realization that we were both stupid and this was over a stupid guy and there was no need to continue. <clears throat> Juror number, stated, juror number seven stated that after she dropped the lawsuit, Marcella and I stood outside and we talked and kind of made amends. As to the timing, juror number seven testified that she was still pregnant with her then third child when she went to court and dropped the lawsuit against, against Miss Kinsley. Woo wee, let's go to footnote 29. At the time of the restraining order litigation, juror number seven had two older children. The first child juror number seven had with Mr. Whiteside was and is her third child. This third child was also the unborn child referred to in her original restraining order application. Given the timeline in the record, it appears that Ms. Kinsley and juror number seven had a truce for over a year. According to juror number seven, however, she believed that Ms. Kinsley still held some animosity towards me because of the love she had for Mr. Whiteside. Juror number seven denied that Ms. Kinsley continued to harass her. I hear this coming up, you guys. Juror number seven testified that she did not know if Ms. Kinsley was ever charged with violating the restraining order. <laughs> the only evidence in the record regarding any alleged restraining order violations were two incidents, two, one reported on July 21st of 2001 and the other reported June 29th of 2002. Mm. Juror number seven only testified about that second violation, June 29th, 2002. According to juror number seven, she was in the hospital having her fourth child. Zooming on down to footnote 30, Mr. Whiteside is also the father of juror number seven's fourth child. Okay. Baby daddy, he's a mess, isn't he? So according to juror number seven, she was in the hospital having her fourth child when the alleged violation occurred. During her hospitalization, there was a video taken which showed Miss Kinsley at Mr. Whiteside's mother's home holding her third child. They were having a party and she was on video holding my son. Juror seven reported. Juror number seven's testimony about what she did after she saw that video was unclear. She testified that she learned about Miss Kinsley being near her son after she was out of the hospital. After seeing the video, juror number seven reached out to either an, an East Palo Alto police officer or a detective. She testified that she wanted to say it was an East Palo Alto police officer, but she was not 100% sure. She then testified that the person she contacted might have been a detective who was kind of a family friend. Hmm. Juror number seven testified that she did not remember another incident where Miss Kinsley violated that restraining order. Juror number seven was asked if she believed that Miss Kinsley's act in holding her son, who was also covered by that December 13th, 2000 restraining order after hearing was a crime. Question, can you tell me, did you believe that Miss Kinsley was committing a crime when she was with your child? Answer, actually, no, I didn't. I talked to the police out of spite question. You called the police out of spite? With some dots. Dot, 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 dot. Answer. Yeah, I did. She was actually being nice to my child, so it wasn't a crime. I was just being spiteful. Section three. Juror number seven in the incident with Eddie Whiteside. Juror number seven was questioned about a November 2nd, 2001 purported... Oh my God. All right. Sorry. I swore I was, I'm not commentarying on this. I'm just reading it. Let me start over. <sighs> Juror number seven was questioned about a November 2nd, 2001 purported domestic violence incident involving Eddie Whiteside that ended in his arrest and pleading, pleading guilty to it, by the way, but I, that's me 
putting that in there. Juror number seven testified that she had had an on again, off again relationship with Mr. Whiteside for about six years. During their relationship, his stuff remained at her house at all times, even though he was not always there. They ultimately had two sons together. With respect to the domestic violence incident, juror number seven testifies to the following. Question. Now, at some point, Mr. Whiteside and you, you discussed, had, an, had a disagreement where you were inside the bedroom. Is that what I understand? Answer, yes. Question. He came in and followed you? Answer, I followed him. Question. Okay. And when you followed him, what happened next? Answer. I handed my mom, my son, and my mom was in the kitchen and he was already in the bedroom and I walked into our bedroom, shut our door and I ran up to him and I took off on him. Question. You say took off? Answer. I'm sorry. Yes. I punched him. Question. How many times? Answer. I don't recall. Question. Was it more than once? Answer. Probably. Question. Okay. Did he punch you back? Answer, he never touched me. Juror number seven testified that during this incident, she believed her lip got caught on her braces, probably when I was screaming at him, causing a small cut. Juror number seven testified adamantly that Mr. Whiteside was not responsible for that cut on her lip. In her words, he didn't do it. He never touched me. Juror number seven testified that she was unsure if Mr. Whiteside suffered any injuries. Question, did he have any injuries? Answer, him, I don't know. Question, yeah, you don't recall when you hit him if he was injured? Answer, no, he was pretty dark skinned, so you can't really tell if he has bruises or not. As a result of the altercation, Mr. Whiteside called the police. Question, what happened? when the police showed up. Answer. What I recall is I opened the door when the police showed up and I said, can I be, can I be candid? Question. Yes, please do. Answer. I said, I didn't fucking call you. I don't have shit to say to you. Go talk to him. He's the, he's the one who called you. Questioner. Okay. Answer. And how, how I remember the police said, what happened to your lip? And I said, I don't know what happened to my lip because I didn't even know there was a little cut. And I said, get the fuck out of my house because I didn't call you. Juror was, number seven was aware that the police took Mr. Whiteside away that night and that he went to jail. Juror number seven testified that Mr. Whiteside returned to her house the next day and stayed for the next Oh, wait, sorry. Stayed for the next few years thereafter? Yeah, that's correct. Um, sorry, I had to make sure I got the years part right. When asked whether she was aware he was going to court as a result of the charges against him, she testified that although she knew that he had a case, she did not discuss the case with him, quote unquote, back then. As she put it, their relationship was complicated at times. And he didn't share all that with me. Juror number seven testified that at the time she was unaware that he had pled guilty to the charges. The juror number seven recalled that a female police officer tried that night or maybe after the fact to get her to say that Mr. Whiteside hit her. But juror number seven refused to do that. They wanted me to say that Eddie hit me and Eddie never hit me. So I wasn't going to do that then. I'm not doing it now or anytime. Eddie never hit me. So I was not the, the victim of any domestic violence. End quote. Juror number seven recalled receiving a restraining order protection, protecting her from Mr. Whiteside, but testified that she ignored it. Quote, he didn't touch me, so he didn't have to stay away from me. I wasn't scared of him unquote. She also testified she threw the restraining order in the garbage. During her testimony, juror number seven agreed that hitting Mr. Whiteside was a crime, but she denied being a witness to a crime because she didn't see herself do it. <laughs> oh God. Okay. Let me just take a drink. You guys, hold on. Give me a second. <sighs> 
send breath. Okay. <laughs> All right. During her testimony, juror number seven agreed that hitting Mr. Whiteside was a crime, but she denied being a witness to a crime because she didn't see herself do it. Quote, I don't stand outside my body and watch myself, but I did punch him. Yes. <laughs> End quote. Juror number seven denied hitting Mr. Whiteside other than that one incident. <clears throat> When asked about the Whiteside incident as it related to jury selection and petitioner's trial, juror number seven said it never crossed her mind. Zoom on down. <sighs> Footnote 31, the November 2nd, 2001 incident is at times in this order now to be referred to as the Whiteside incident. All right. Fair enough. Juror number seven testified that had this incident crossed her mind or had she been asked about it, juror number seven would have immediately disclosed it. We've heard that before. Issue number four, bullet point four, just, uh, juror number seven as a victim or witness to a crime. Despite being questioned by petitioner several times, juror number seven was adamant throughout her two-day testimony that at the time of jury selection, she did not believe she was the victim or witness of a crime involving either Miss Kinsley or Mr. Whiteside. Quote, I wasn't and I am still not any victim, end quote. As it pertains to Miss Kinsley, juror number seven testified she did not see Miss Kinsley slash Eddie Whiteside's tires. <laughs> she did not witness Miss Kinsley kicking down their door and it was probably Mr. Whiteside who told her that Miss Kinsley had sprayed him with mace. <clears throat> Juror number seven acknowledged that she considered Miss Kinsley stalking and kicking in the front door of her home's crimes. But juror number seven explained, however, that she only sought a restraining order because at the time she was pregnant and she knew that her and Miss Kinsley would eventually fight. Juror number seven did not want to fight Miss Kinsley while she was pregnant. Juror number seven was unwavering in her testimony that throughout her life she's been in many fights and therefore does not consider herself a victim. Might be different for you or somebody else. You may consider a fight and you might consider yourself a victim, but I did not. End quote. Section B, other witness called, other witnesses called during the evidentiary hearing. This one is fun. So I think I will read through this section, you guys, which will bring us about halfway. Um, and then I'm going to cut this video, get it up, and this will just be part one. And then we'll do a part two because this, like I said, is a long, long document. Um <laughs> It's getting harder for me to just read it. You know what I mean? Okay. So we're going to start with Greg Baratlis. He was another juror. Greg Baratlis served as an original juror in petitioner's case and participated in jury deliberations for both the guilt and penalty phase. He also wrote a book with her, by the way. During the guilt phase of deliberations, two jurors were removed and two alternates were substituted in. The first alternate being juror number seven. Mr. Baratlis explained that prior to the alternates being seated, the jurors had a process in the jury deliberation room. In addition to charting things out and putting things on the wall to assist in their deliberations, the jury spent a little time respecting each other's thoughts and giving a little time to basically get out what each had kept inside for the whole trial. According to Mr. Baratlis, when juror number seven entered the jury deliberation room, she immediately blurted out that the petitioner should pay for killing, quote unquote, little man. Mr. Baratlis, his understanding of little man was that she was talking about Lacey's unborn child, Connor. After making that comment, and since juror number seven was, quote unquote, the new kid on the block, Mr. Baratlis immediately informed her that we have a process in place before she just gave her opinions. According to Mr. Baratlis, juror number seven was not making any signs or gestures when she made the comment about little man. Mr. Baratlis also testified that juror number seven did nothing aggressive in any way. Witness number two was Alfreda Brackshire. Alfreda Brackshire was called by the petitioner to authenticate records from East Palo Alto Police Department. 
Ms. Brackshire is the current custodian of records and has been a record clerk for EPA PD for approximately 10 years. Ms. Brackshire was familiar with the records information system and the EPA PD currently uses to maintain their records in this way, among other things, police reports. Um, the records information management systems called RIMS from here on out. RIMS was not in place, however, in 2001. In the old system, police officers would write a paper report, a narrative, and while the face, while the face sheets were later entered into RIMS, some of the original reports and narratives had been purged. Petitioner issued a subpoena to the EPA PD for records pertaining to the November 2001 incident between juror number seven and Mr. Whiteside. Uh, that incident number, by the way, is EP01-306-17. Uh, In response, Ms. Brackshire filled out a declaration as custodian and returned one record of incident, EP01-306-17. Ms. Brackshire testified that petitioner's counsel sent her a declaration that she was to fill in and return. On the stand, Ms. Brackshire admitted that she had made a mistake in paragraph 5 of her November 30th, 2021 declaration. Paragraph 5 incorrectly stated that Ms. Brackshire had prepared the original records from which the accompanying copies were made. Ms. Brackshire's testified, however, as follows. Question, but you didn't prepare that report, did you? Answer, no, I did not. And what, I guess I misinterpreted it because when I read it, I produced it and that's what I was thinking. When I signed it, her declaration, that's what I meant. I didn't mean that I actually generated the report. I simply provided the report. I printed the report, which in hindsight is not generating now that I think about it this way. Ms. Brackshire admitted to another error in the records she submitted. When asked by petitioner's counsel to certify screenshots, of other incidents appearing in RIMS, different incident numbers, you guys, so take notes if you're listening for that purpose. Okay. E01-202-19 and E02-182-18 involving Ms. Kinsley allegedly violating Penal Code Section 166A4 Contempt to disobey a court order. These are the restraining order violations. She admitted that she mistakenly also certified an email sent by someone unrelated to the EPA PD. Question, do you see the red stamp? Answer, yes. Question, so just to be clear, when you were asked for a certified copy, you put the red stamp on the email that the HRC, that's the Habeas Corpus Resource Center, sent to you? Answer, yeah, I did. I don't know why I did, but yes, I did. Question, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last part of what you said. Answer, I said, yes, I did. I don't know why I did, but yes, I did. Question, can you certify somebody else's email? Answer, not at all, no. With respect to the incident involving Mr. Uh, Mr. Eddie Whiteside, Ms. Brackshire testified that in the RIMS report, juror number seven was identified as the confidential victim and Mr. Whiteside as the suspect regarding the alleged restraining order violations by Ms. Kinsley. Ms. Braxter testified that one incident was reported on July 21st, 2001, and the other was reported on June 29th of 2002. Um, again, just for clarification, July 1st, 2001, incident of violation of the restraining order, E01-202-19, Second violation, June 29th, 2002, E02-182-18. With respect to the July 21st, 2001 incident, the victim was reported to be juror number seven. As to the June 29th, 2002 incident, juror number seven was again listed as the victim. Neither incident listed juror number seven's son as the victim. Next witness, witness number three was Shireen Anderson. Shireen Anderson was listed as a witness by the petitioner. Ms. Anderson had interviewed juror number seven after the trial as part of an A&E documentary. Prior to hearing her testimony at the evidentiary hearing, Ms. Anderson invoked the journalistic privilege pursuant to evidence code section 1070. 
In lieu of calling her, the party stipulated as follows. If called to testify, Shireen Anderson would testify that in 2017, she interviewed juror number seven at juror number seven's home. After the interview, as Miss Anderson was leaving, she saw a photograph on the wall of a small child. The child was wearing clothing that had the words little man printed visibly on them. Witness number four, Mark Garagos. Mark Garagos was listed as a witness for the petitioner in support of the original habeas petition. Mr. Garagos submitted a declaration. See exhibit 49 to this petition for habeas corpus. The party stipulated that Mr. Garagos did not need to be called a, as a witness, but that if called to testify, he would testify to the following. Let's see here. Number one, I was lead counsel for defendant Scott Peterson in People versus Peterson. SC 055500A, and I conducted the jury selection process. As part of the process, I reviewed the jury questionnaires of the prospective jurors. Number two, juror number seven was initially selected as an alternative juror. She later became a seated juror. I reviewed her jury questionnaire, and I also questioned her during voir dire. Number three, when juror seven was selected as an alternate and later seated, I did not know any of the circumstances that have been alleged by petitioner regarding juror number seven's background. Number four, I had been a trial lawyer for almost 40 years. Had I known any of the circumstances that have been alleged by petitioner regarding juror number seven's background, I would have challenged juror seven for cause. There is no way I would have wanted such a juror on the jury for which would decide Mr. Peterson's fate. If the trial court did not grant a four cause challenge, I would certainly have excused her using the exercise of a preemptory challenge on this particular juror. Jointly stipulated February 28th, 2022. Witness five, Justin Falconer. Justin Falconer, one of the original jurors, was listed as a witness by the petitioner. At the time of the evidentiary hearing, Mr. Falconer was in Iraq training dogs with the United States military. <clears throat> petitioner made an offer of proof that if called, Mr. Falconer would be would be testifying to four points. Number one, juror number seven talked about Connor a lot and referred to him as a little man during the trial aka when they're not supposed to be talking about it yet. Number two, juror number seven said she was having money problems as the result of her job not paying her. Number three, juror number seven told him that she could have been excused for financial hardship, but she stayed because she wanted to be on the jury. And number four, juror number seven statements about a book deal. Petitioner requested that Mr. Falkner in Iraq, in the army, serving our country, uh, be permitted to appear for the hearing through Zoom or other remote technology. Respondent opposed. According to respondent, Mr. Falkner was in a unique situation because the trial judge dismissed him as a juror, citing a lack of credibility. <sighs> Petitioner did not dispute that Mr. Falkner had been dismissed for the reasons stated by the respondent, but respondent argued, and the court agreed, that an in-person testimony was required to the court as the fact finder could observe Mr. Falkner as it had all the other witnesses during this evidentiary hearing and assess his credibility in the same manner as it would other live witnesses. In addition to opposing a remote appearance, there was confusion as to whether the Habeas Corpus Resource Center investigator had secured a second declaration from Mr. Falkner that it had not provided to the respondent despite court order discovery. The court granted petitioner additional time to secure the attendance of Mr. Falkner in person, but ultimately Mr. Falkner was unable to appear in person for testimony to conclude the evidentiary hearing. And we are going to uh, take a break there. So this will be part one, you guys. Coming back, we're going to have the legal standards and the opinion. You have all the background now, so it's going to be the meat. It'll be the law. And the ruling next, of course, everyone knows how, how this turned out, but 
um, the rationale is, is amazing. Okay. So I will see you next time. Give this a like, a thumbs up, share it around if you'd like. Um, I'd like for people to be able to hear this. Like I said, it's such a long document. I don't blame anyone who doesn't want to listen, you know, or doesn't want to read through it. It's much easier to listen, get to pause it, come back when you want to. And I will see you for part two. Thanks for hanging in there with us.